Uh, hello and welcome to uh, Advancing Pong, which is the second part of my Zero to Pong series. Uh, this is part B of the second episode. Uh, so in this video, there, there are a few bits that are like not necessarily so coherent because I did spend like an hour and a half recording this video. And so towards the end, uh, I wasn't necessarily as good at like explaining things and then like be able to cut that into a nice segment of the video. So there's like literally a point where I had to add an editor's note because it was <laughs> just to the point where it was impossible to find all the information and like coherently string it together without recording something additional. Whereas uh, when I have more of mind, I tend to like do something and I'll talk to my sort of self while I do it. And then at the end, I'll have a written bit of code and explain what each bit does. Uh, there wasn't as many of those in the section. So do forgive this video not being as coherent as hopefully other videos were and, and will be. Uh, but I, I did think it was kind of important to sort of tack this on. So this is just a continuation on from the previous video. So feel free to skip this one if you don't want uh, to watch it, uh, but it's somewhat interesting adding a scoring system to our Pong game. So the first step to adding scoring is to actually add the scoring interface so that you can see when the player scores, it'll be rendered on the screen. So to do this, we're gonna basically just as it's become pretty common now, create a spawn score system. So for the scoreboard, I've decided to go with a UI element, which is in this case, a node bundle to show off two different things. One, Bevy's Flexbox system of using the UI nodes. I originally was gonna use them in the first episode. And then I realized that sprites are better for the moving of the paddles, whereas UI is better for rendering scores and things like that. So we'll use scores for this. So the first thing I've done is spawn in a node bundle. This is going to hold our scoreboard itself but not actually be rendered. It's just going to be so that our scores are held in a specific position. And that comes to point two of why I'm using doing it this particular approach is this means that we can use the with children in order to spawn subsections of elements, allowing us to basically attach either player's score to the scoreboard without needing to spawn them and attach them independently. As always, we need to remember to include our spawning of our UI in the startup system. So in this case, it's going to be just placed at the beginning here. So the first step is spawning the base node. So in this particular case, we're going to give it a position type of absolute so that it doesn't get pushed around by other nodes that we spawn at any point in the future. We're going to give it a margin of auto on the horizontal so that it is centered in the middle of the screen. We're going to give it a top position of zero so that it's attached to the top of the screen, a width of 30% of the width of the screen, and a height of 20% of the height of the screen. Everything else for now can be left default. So that we can see it, we're going to give it a background color of light gray. I did have to import the light gray uh, at the top here. You can see that CSS light gray has come in. This allows us to use the light gray type without having to directly declare it. And then we'll move on to spawning the children just after I show you what it looks like. So as you can see, we have this large light gray square at the top here. If we full screen, the, the square stays fixed at the top of the screen. So next, we're going to be spawning in uh, basically two pieces of text. In this particular case, we're going to be flagging with which player that text represents. What we're going to do is go in our with children function. We're going to go p.spawn, and this is going to be a text bundle. Next, we need to specify our text. Here, we're going to say this is going to be player one. So we're going to say justify, which is going to be justify text to the left. Uh, line break, break line on no wrap and then our sections here is going to be and then we need to say text section just do the one text section which is going to have the value of uh zero dot two string and a style of text style we need to have a font handle which i think bevy now provides the default font so we can just say default uh, and then a font size of maybe 100 so this should give us a nice big font and then i believe there's a default font so if you wanted to you could use the asset loader to load a specific font here that should load in our player one font with our, with our font bundle. We also want to include the actual player one. This is going to be used later to determine like how do we actually update the player. So player, and this is going to be player one. This is player one spawn. And then we come down here, we spawn in, in here. We're just going to do nothing. And we're going to spawn in just a bar like this. And that's going to separate our two scores. And then we're just going to make this player two. So in theory, this should be right. And we're going to have our font on the screen and our players should, with the way that the text works, just have zero, zero. Yep. See here. And then I believe next we need to show um, that we want to justify this font's font to the other side, which means we justify it right. And then this one we want to justify center so that our text is all in the right positions. I don't think this is going to do what we want because the, the font itself is independent. Like the justifying of the fonts independent of where the place of the font is. Yep. So next, I believe what we want to do is say um, up here, justify the content with the space between. Let's see if that works. 
this is one of those, uh, I don't know Flexbox well enough to give you good advice. I usually use the Bevy Editor and then I'll, uh, Bevy Editor please and we'll tweak the values until I get the result I want. There we go. So now they're, they're spaced out equally at the side, giving us a nice scoreboard. Though we do need to change that light gray to like maybe dark gray because uh, <laughs> it's pretty hard to read. So we'll go up here and say when we specify the background color. So we'll just import dark gray and get rid of light gray. Like so, we'll just swap that. Some nice little UX changes. Uh, we can put corners and stuff on it, but that's all cosmetic that I don't necessarily want to go into too much. But as you can see, we now have our score. The next is to actually cause the score to update. So to do this, we're going to come down here and we're going to create a resource. We're going to derive a score resource. This is done, just done by deriving resource on any struct in Rust or any enum. And then this score struct is going to contain a hash map of our players and their corresponding score. This does mean that we need to go up to our player struct here and then say that it also derives uh, equal, parse, equal, and hash to allow it to be used as part of a hash map. Oh, I guess as the key of a hash map and then down here, we're going to implement our scoring system. So we will read our game events and then we will have a game event to gain our score. Uh, we're going to query for all of the texts that have a player so that we can update the specific score of each player as they gain score. And then we are going to include our score resource to keep track of the actual absolute score. And if we wanted to say keep a high score or something, we could use this later. So this is going to be res uh, score. Uh, we're also going to go up to score and derive default. Deriving default will allow us to initialize the score rather than have to specifically go out of our way to provide what the base score is. So next we need to go to our game events and we need to say that a new type of game event is gain point. And this is also going to take a player as an argument. So basically when you hit the goal, you're going to gain a point for that specific player. Then down here, uh, so we're going to iterate through all of the game events, and then we're going to say match event. In this case, the only game event we care about is gaining score. So gain point and then player. In this particular case, we're going to say game event reset ball is going to do nothing. The reason I'm doing this is if in the future we decide that there's a gain double points or something like that, we want the compiler to tell us that we're not dealing with a specific game event, whereas the reset ball is never going to do anything but reset the ball, so it can only look at that event the gain points in the future may gain something that we want the compiler to tell us that we're not compensating for that score. Like maybe we will be able to lose point or something. We want the compiler to tell us that we're not dealing with that particular case. So next is to update the actual score. So in this particular case, I'm going to use something that uh, I'm not sure a lot of new people to Rust know about, which is on a hash map, we can call entry and then provide a actual, like not reference to our key, but an actual usable key. And then we can call or default, which will mean that it will either return the value already in the hash map, or it'll insert one into the hash map and return that. So we can do that instead of having to make sure that the player's already scored at least one point, and then we can just add equals one to that. So next, we can actually get our score that the player is currently up to, which in this case we call get, then we call cloned, just so that we don't have to provide a reference to a uh, integer. And then we unwrap or default to zero, just in case. So now we're gonna iterate through all the text and update the score of the player whose score is different. So in this case, we're gonna go, if the owner does not equal the player, which is gaining the point, we will continue. Then we're gonna say text uh, sections, zero, because each of the players only had a single text section, and then dot value equals uh, our score dot two string. This should allow for our score to be translated into a string and updated for the player. And then after we've done this, we want to uh, break because if we find the player his score updating, we want to return early. We need to add our score updating, which again, we're going to do with the reset ball code so that it happens after the update system. So this is going to be update score. We also need to make sure we initialize our score uh, resource. So we'll do that right at the top after we initialize the default plugins. We'll say app init resource and then provide score as our resource that we're initializing this will initialize the resource with its default values whereas otherwise we would have to provide the values that we want to initialize it with and then when we say run this should do nothing because we forgot to add scoring when we uh actually do that so in our detect reset so when when we uh don't hit 
not when we hit space bar, but when the player actually hits, or when the ball hits the player's goal, we're going to say game event dot send, and we're going to say game event game point, and then give that to point to the current player. Again, we need to reference it, and this should result in the players being able to gain points when the ball hits the opponent's goal. Now, again, we've written some of the code in such a way that only the player who's actually um, like it, it, some of the code is only two player based, like the fact that the goal gives the point to the opposite player. Whereas what we could do is make it whoever hit the ball last is the person who gains control of the ball, say. And gaining control of the ball will mean that when it goes into someone's goal, you gain the point. So as you can see, the score updated. Uh, currently, <laughs> the, the ball is able to go behind the scoreboard, but it's not really much we can do about that. We could lower its layer down so that it doesn't. But with that, we, we have our scoring implemented. So next, I'm just going to add some, some basic cosmetic stuff just to spice up the video and make it look like the thumbnail. Uh, you know, going to have interesting thumbnails. So just when I was going back through editing this, uh, I realized that the video had been recording for like an hour and a half at this point. Uh, so my sort of pattern's really co incoherent and it just got chopped up too much, me explaining what I was trying to do. So what I ended up doing uh, is I added a function get color to the player, which will return the color of the player. In the future, this could be replaced with like a resource that lets you set the color of the player or like each player could customize their own color. Uh, and then when I spawn the player, I say player.getColor and also include the um, player identifier on each of the paddles so that when the ball hits the paddle, I can use that lookup to set the color of the paddle. And then uh, hopefully the rest of the video is coherent enough for this to make sense. If not, the GitHub is linked below so you can sort of read through the code and see what I did. We're going to set the, those to be red and green. And then just for some extra like flair, you know, ball hit function, all we're doing is changing the color of the ball based on what player it hit. So this is done similar to how we detected if it needed to be reset, but instead of checking for colliders, we're checking for the, the ball. We get all the hits and we also get access to its sprite. We then iterate through all the hits and then check to see if any of the, them are the paddles, collecting the player data if they are, and then we set the ball's color equal to the color of the corresponding paddle that it just hit. And then so we need to include this in our post update, I guess. I guess technically we want this to be done in update. So we're going to say uh, ball hit like so. This should now allow for our ball to change color based on which paddle it hits. And the color of the paddle is determined by what player the paddle is. It should look like the thumbnail now, at least a little bit more. We could also set the color of the text. So we have a red paddle and a green paddle. And then in theory, when we hit the ball, it turns green. And then when it comes back over the other side and we hit it again, it should turn red. We could do other things like make the ball uh, a different color depending on if no player is controlling it. So there you go, to red. All right, uh, thank you for making it to the end of the video. Got my first Kofi supporter. It's actually someone that's come across from a Patreon. Uh, so I actually know their name. I, I don't know why. Uh, yeah, why? Your name is just, uh, damn it, I can't speak. It's Kofi supporter, not fucking Patreon supporter. Anyway, Patreon supporter. But you literally sent me a DM saying like that you swapped over. So I know who it is. Uh, so here's your name at the end of the video. I'm going to call you out because why not? Just be my only one at the moment. Uh, I really appreciate you coming over. So it's all cool. Um, and stay tuned for the next video. I was reading the uh, Bevy newsletter and saw that there's a new UI framework that like just got an update or something. Uh, so I'm looking to that and we'll see if we can bring that in to add like a UI to our game, like a proper like main menu and stuff with buttons. So that's going to be the next week's video. And I hope you've all enjoyed and like, comment, subscribe, share the video, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one.